All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series, where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. In a shared living space, Quinn consistently leaves dirty dishes and spills on the common kitchen counter. After multiple reminders, the roommates implement a new rule that says if Quinn leaves a mess, Quinn must not only clean it up, but also wipe down all other counters and organize the dish rack. Which procedure best describes requiring Quinn to, to more than fix the original mess? So we have a punishment procedure question here. And how do we know it's a punishment procedure? Because we know it's some sort of overcorrection procedure. If we look at what is occurring, we have Quinn, who lives with roommates, and Quinn is always leaving dirty dishes and spills on the kitchen counter. After being reminded many times, they put a rule in place that says, if Quinn leaves a mess, Quinn must not only clean up the mess, but also must do more than fix the original mess, like wipe down all other counters and organize the dish rack. So we know it's overcorrection, because overcorrection typically is in response to a behavior we make that person correct that behavior in a positive way. Maybe we make them do the right thing over and over again. Sometimes in necess not necessarily a positive way, but maybe a negative way where we have them engage in the wrong behavior over and over again. Or we have a situation where we have the person not only correct what the behavior caused, but also go above and beyond. So if you look at A, overcorrection, we do know it's an overcorrection answer. But this is a good example of why we always read all of our answer choices. If you just picked A, you would be correct. It is overcorrection. But is there a better answer? And you're always looking for the best possible answer on your exam. Well, B is going to be the better answer. Restitution or overcorrection is when the person who engages in the behavior must fix the behavior or whatever the behavior caused. So in this case, the cleanliness but also restore the environment better than before. So not only must Quinn, Quinn clean up his mess, but they also have to wipe down the counters and organize the dish rack. If we look at C and D, positive practice overcorrection and negative practice overcorrection, with positive practice, you would make Quinn engage in the correct behavior repeatedly. With negative practice, Quinn would have to engage in the wrong behavior repeatedly. But both of those have nothing to do with restoring or correcting the environment. Since Quinn is correcting the environment, this is going to be B, restitutional overcorrection. Morgan frequently hums a soft tune throughout the workday. Coworkers sometimes notice and comment. Some find it soothing. Others find it slightly distracting. However, Morgan hums just as often when alone as when others are around. When asked why she hums, Morgan says it helps her concentrate and calm her thoughts. Despite occasional positive and negative feedback from colleagues, the humming rate remains unchanged. Which function of behavior best explains why Morgan continues to hum regularly? So function question. And this is a good reminder that we need to focus on not only the more difficult ideas in ABA, but also the basics. You've got to know the basics and you've got to be fluent in everything. And this is a more difficult function question because there's a few things happening, right? We know the behavior is humming. Now, when thinking about function, we wanna know when the behavior occurs, and then what is the consequence for that behavior? What is affecting that behavior in the future? Is it decreasing it? Is it increasing it? Why is the behavior happening? We know she hums throughout the workday. Coworkers even comment and notice on the humming. But we know Morgan also hums when she's alone. Morgan says it helps her concentrate and calm her. We also know that despite feedback from colleagues, both positive, they find it soothing, and negative, slightly distracting, the humming doesn't change. So you have to ask yourself, has the attention from the colleagues affected the humming at all? No, the humming doesn't change despite positive or negative feedback from colleagues. And Morgan even hums, when she's alone. So even when attention isn't available, M Morgan is still humming. 
Why do we think the behavior is occurring? A, escape. Nothing in the question would indicate this is happening for escape. Morgan doesn't seem to be escaping from anything. B, tangible. Morgan isn't obtaining an item, so it can't be a tangible. Attention would be the only other possible answer besides automatic, but we know that despite feedback, both positive and negative, the feedback doesn't affect the humming, and Morgan does it when she's alone. So it doesn't seem like Morgan is doing this for attention, and the attention isn't having any effect on the humming. So most likely, this is going to be an automatic function. Morgan is doing it for, let's say, a sensory reason, because it's happening even when she's alone, and the attention has no impact on the behavior. At a small startup company, the office manager introduces a strict policy. If an employee is late more than once a week, they must stay an extra hour on Friday without pay. After this policy is announced, employees begin arriving on time more consistently. Which principle most likely explains why employees' tardiness decreases? Pretty straightforward question, but we want to read carefully. The question is asking about the decrease in employees' tard tardiness. So we know we're looking at the behavior going down or decreasing. And what decreases behavior? Either extinction or punishment. Now, if you're reading quickly, you might also say, without thinking about what the question is asking, that the employee's behavior is increasing, which is also true. But the question doesn't want to know about the increase. They want to know about the decrease. Since they want to know about the decrease, this has to be extinction or punishment. Now, since we know it's extinction or punishment, is something being added or taken away? Well, the policy says if the employee is late, then they must stay an extra hour. So they're being punished. The extra hour is being added. It's going to be positive. So we're going to a consequence that is adding something that is decreasing behavior. It's clearly going to be positive punishment. It can't be A because we are looking at the decrease in behavior and reinforcement only increases. Yes, they begin arriving on time more consistently, but we're not looking at that. We're looking at the decrease in the tardiness. B, positive punishment. Yes, right? We're adding the hour and it's decreasing the behavior. Positive punishment. It isn't negative punishment because we're not taking away anything. And it can't be D because we know, again, it isn't reinforcement. We're looking at a decrease in behavior, which makes this punishment. We also know it's added, which makes it positive. Sasha typically ignores the snack bar at work. However, after skipping breakfast and feeling very hungry, Sasha heads straight to the snack bar buying multiple items. On other days when Sasha has already eaten a large meal, the snack bar holds little appeal, which best describes how Sasha's level of hunger affects the snacks. So we're looking at level of hunger in the relationship to the snacks. Now we can kind of see how this is going to be a motivating operation question. Why do we know that? Well, when Sasha is hungry, her behavior changes, right? She goes to the snack bar to get snacks. When she's not hungry, she doesn't go, and the snacks aren't really very appealing. So how is that level of hunger affecting the snacks? A, Sasha's level of hunger establishes the snacks as reinforcers. Is that true? Is Sasha's level of hunger establishing the snacks? It is. With motivating operations. They can establish, they can abolish, they can evoke, and they can abate. When we're talking about establishing and abolishing, we're talking about the, the consequence. And the value of the snacks goes up when she's hungry. What about B? Sasha's level of hunger abolishes the snacks as reinforcers. Yes. When Sasha is not hungry, what happens to the value of the snacks? It goes down. Now, if we look at C, Sasha's level of hunger evokes the snacks as reinforcers. Well, the level of hunger is not evoking the snacks. It's evoking the behavior. You've got to be very careful with the wording of motivating operations. We're going to establish or abolish the consequence. We're going to evoke or abate the behavior. And so since the question is asking about the snacks, the level of hunger is establishing or abolishing the snacks as these reinforcing consequences. It is not evoking the snack, it's evoking the behavior. So in that case, yes, Sasha's level of hunger establishes the snacks. Yes, Sasha's level of hunger abolishes the snacks. 
No, they don't evoke the snacks. They evoke the behavior. So our answer is both A and B. A consultant who incorporates behavior analytic strategies and corporate coaching and business management writes an online article claiming they can cure all workplace issues and guarantees a positive change in the workplace. Some of your colleagues become concerned these statements misrepresent the field of behavior analysis and its evidence-based limitations. What would you advise your colleagues to do first as a behavior analyst? So you're in a position where you need to advise your colleagues as a group of behavior analysts analyses or analyst, right? We have a consultant who is using behavior analytics strategies in corporate coaching and business management, and they claim they can cure all workplace issues and guarantee positive change. Now, if we're going to use behavior analytics strategies and claim to be BCBAs, we clearly can't make these claims about the field. We don't know if this consultant is a BCBA or not. We just know they're using behavior analytic strategies. So it's two different things. Your colleagues are concerned they might mis misrepresent the field of behavior analysis. That's a problem. Even if someone who isn't a behavior analyst is using behavior analytic strategies in a way that we might feel makes the, the field look bad, we should say something. If they're not certified under the board, do they abide to our ethical code? No, but it's our duty because we do abide by the ethical code to say something. So in this case, what would you advise your colleagues to do as behavior analysts? A, ignore the article since the consultant is talking about their own business. Doesn't matter what business they're talking about. If they feel that this consultant is misrepresenting the field, we must say something. B, report the consultant to the Behavior Analytics Certification Board. With ethics, unless someone's already been hurt, we need to try to figure out the issue amongst ourselves before going to the board. So before we report this person, we need to talk to them and they might not even realize what they're doing. C, reach out to the consultant's clients and inform them that the consultant is acting unethic unethically. You definitely shouldn't do that without talking to the consultant first. They have the, the right and you should give them, them that level of respect where you're gonna talk to them first before taking drastic measures. So what you wanna do is advise your colleagues to reach out to the consultant to express the concerns. Now, again, with ethics, you always want to try to talk to the person first before escalating the issue. They might not even be aware that you're acting unethically. If someone's been hurt or it's a very serious issue, obviously that changes. But in most ethical issues, you need to confront that person first before escalating further. Thanks for watching. Sorry for my cold. Hopefully I'm better next week. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Like and subscribe for all of our updates. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.